Welcome to the course on Scalable Data Science. Uh, my name is Anirban. I'm from IIT Kanthinagar. Today's lecture is going to be on uh, the apps, looking at a small application for random projections uh, and, look, and then looking at some other algorithms for improving the type of random projections that we, were looking, uh, that we had looked at before. Right? So just to remind you, we were studying this johnson linden strauss lemma. Right? What it says is that if you're given a set of points, x1 to xn, in some d-dimensional space, and it doesn't really matter how big this d is. And what you're interested in is in creating a mapping that creates the images of these points in some lower dimensional space, let me call that k, okay, such that the pairwise distance between any two points is more or less preserved. So you're interested in, in, in coming up with with representation, with the representation of all the points, such that the pairwise distances are more or less preserved. And the factor to which you want them preserved is given by the, this value epsilon. Right? So every distance needs to be preserved to a factor 1 plus minus epsilon, to, to a multiplicative factor 1 plus minus epsilon. Right? And, uh, and when we're talking about distances, we're always talking about L2 distances here. So Johnson and Indertron says is that there exists a linear mapping, right, such that the target dimension is C over epsilon square log n, and this mapping is, is created by the Gaussian, by sort of uh, filling it up, by filling up the matrix with Gaussian, independent Gaussian random variables, okay? And what we'll guarantee is that with very high probability, for every pair, ij, the distance xi to, uh, the distance axi minus axj will be within a one plus minus epsilon factor of the distance xi minus xj. Okay. So a couple of things before we move on into looking at an application. First of all, it is known that the bound on the bound on k that this theorem achieves, which is this one by epsilon square log one by delta. Remember why this log one by delta came? Because in proving the Johnson Linden Strauss theorem. The, the final result about the about the inch two pairs, we were proving a core lemma, the core Johnson, which is actually known as the JL lemma, in which we said that for a for a given for a given distance x or for, or for a given point x, its length is preserved with probability one minus delta if the target dimension is is c over epsilon square log one by delta, right? And then we were applying a union bound to to preserve the distances of all inch two pairs. Okay, so and this and this. What this theorem says, what, what these results show, this the result by Allen and the result by Jaram and Woodruff, is that this bound is tight. Right? That if if you want such a mapping, you need to depend it, it has to be, it has to take at least one over epsilon, the target dimension has to be at least one over epsilon square. It also has to be at least log one by delta. And these are information theoretic bounds. You can't really do much better, however smart your algorithm is. Right? It's also very interesting to note that the target dimension does not depend on the original dimension, as we have mentioned before. Another very interesting and non-trivial result is to show that, that such a result cannot really hold in L1, for instance. Right? That in some sense, in a very strong sense, that such a result more or less characterizes the Euclidean metric. Okay? So these are all pretty theoretical results that we're not going to go into the details of, but they are, but they are, I mean, they're very insightful, they're very good to know. Okay, so now, so now let's talk about other ways of creating this matrix. Remember, the way we were creating the matrix is by, is by creating this matrix R, such that Rij is, is N01. Okay, and then we made sure that every column of R is normalized is has 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 one norm that is more or less equal to one, right? So the one so the, had has two norm that is more or less equal to uh, that is more or less equal to one because the the norm of every column the expected norm of let's say the column one is equal to k, right? And if I divide by square root one over square root k, if I if I take a equal to one over square root k times r, then the expected norm uh, of the of the first column of a becomes one, and that's what I really wanted. Right? So therefore, I, I need to normalize it by 1 over square root k in order to, in order to actually get the, the jail matrix. So another way, another 
interesting way, and this was uh, given by actually Optus in 2003, of creating this matrix is to say that, oh, don't bother with normal random variables because they're expensive to uh, sort of sample from, they're expensive to create, they're expensive to store because you need to store floating point numbers and so on. Right? Instead, create this R in the following way. For every entry, independently toss a coin. And now this is a three-headed coin, right? With probability two-third, it gives you zero. With probability one-third, it gives you plus one. Probability uh, one-third, it gives you minus one. So again, it is unbiased. So just like the original RIJs, which I got in was unbiased, every, every RIJ is unbiased. It, it has a variance uh, that is bounded by expectation of RI, that is expectation of RIJ square is, uh, is one-third plus one-third, which is equal to two-third, okay? And uh, this is also fine. We can show exactly the same kind of guarantees for this R as we can do for the, for the original R. Which is, the, which is created out of normal random variables. Furthermore, any Rij that is created from what is known as a sub-Gaussian distribution with variance one would work. So intuitively, a sub-Gaussian distribution is one whose tail decays faster than the normal distribution. Right? That, is a, that, that is the intuition of a sub-Gaussian distribution. So, uh, so you could sample Rij independently from any such distribution you need to normalize it so that it has variance one, and then and then you're fine. Okay, you can prove the same kind of inequalities. So let's see a specific application of this uh, random projection. So suppose we have uh, a matrix A in R n by D, right? And we want to get a low rank approximation. Let's say a rank K approximation for a specific K. So notice that uh, I'm sort of overloading k. This k is disjoint, is, is, is not the same as the, as the k in the random projection that we're talking about. Here, here we're using is, it as a local variable. We want to get a rank approximation a prime so that a minus a prime, the Frobenius norm is minimized. If you remember, if you don't, don't remember what the Frobenius norm is, so a minus a prime Frobenius norm squared is defined as the summation over all the entries, a minus a prime ij squared. You take the ijth entry, you sort of square it, and then you sum up the squares. Okay? So we know what the optimal such a prime is. You have, you've already seen it in, uh, in, previous, in previous lectures. The optimal low rank approximation is given by what is known as a singular value decomposition. So what you do is that you, uh, you, first, you first do a singular value decomposition, uh, sing, a singular vector, singular value decomposition of A, which is given by U sigma V transpose, where U has orthogonal columns, V, v uh, and, and, and so does V, and the sigma is a diagonal matrix. And then if you want a, a rank approximation of the, the optimal rank approximation, if you want uh, AK, if you want prime to be of rank A, right? Then you keep only K singular values in sigma, the corresponding singular vectors in U, and the corresponding singular vectors in V transpose, right? And this is denoted by UK, sigma k and vk transpose, okay? So this is how we solve the problem. The problem is that it takes time that's almost cubic in the data, in the, in the, that's almost like nd times, uh, nd times n times d, mean of nd, right? So, so, so if, so if n and d are the same, it takes time n cubed, more or less, if, if n is close to d, right? So that's cubic in the number of data points. That is not acceptable. Okay? So, so I want to do this much, much faster. At least approximate this much, much faster. So, so how do we do this? So before we do this, we need to look a little bit into, into some linear algebra. So recall that this, I mean, we can write down the matrix AK also in terms of a projection of the columns of A onto some space. So what is this space? You create a projection matrix out of the first k singular vectors of, of A. So UK are the first k singular vectors of A. And you create a projection matrix of rank k. So UK is of size n, so uh, UK is of size n by k. So you create a project, so this projection matrix is of size n by n. So it projects the columns of A onto the space spanned by the first k singular vectors of A. Right? So this is equal to AK actually. And we know that A minus this P A K A two norm of this equal to sigma K plus one. So notice this is the matrix two norm, right? Uh, we also know 
uh, using uh, using results from uh, from Friesken and Vampala that for any matrix B, right? That suppose uh, we look at any matrix, any other matrix B, and instead of taking the matrix, instead of taking the top k singular vectors of the matrix A, let me look at the top k singular vectors of the matrix B, and 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 and, and project the columns of A onto that space, right? So how close do we get from the error that we were getting when we were using A k, right? So justifiably, if b is, I mean, if, uh, you can imagine that if b is close to a, right, then this error, the error on the left-hand side, should be similar to this error, right? In fact, if b is exactly equal to k, then the two errors are obviously equal, right? So this result by Friesken and Vampala shows that if b is close to a, then, then, then the error that you see out here, while it is at most sigma k plus 1, because this is the sigma k plus 1 is the optimal error, right? And we're looking at the two norm of the matrix here. While this error is at least, is at least uh, sigma k plus 1, it is at most sigma k plus 1 plus a term that depends on the difference between a and b. So this difference is given by square root of the two norm of the matrix uh, a transpose minus bb transpose, okay? So if I can make b, b close to a, accord, yeah, I mean, if I can make b such that this error is small, Right? Then I get that the, the error obtained by a minus pb, a minus pbk of a is also small. Right? It is not very far off from the optimal error, which is sigma k plus 1. So I want to create a b that is efficiently computable and small in size. Right? And it should lead to small, low error. So concretely, what I want is that I want this quantity, the, the term that is computing to the, to the error, to be at most epsilon times the, the error, uh, the, the two norm of the A transpose, right? Why am I choosing this quantity? Because it's going to come up in my analysis. Okay, so, so how do I create such a B efficiently? It turns out that creating such a B is very, very easy, right? And this is what I call uh, cheap and effective low rank approximation. Given a matrix A, which, is, which lies in N by D, right? We just sample a D by K matrix, JL matrix, R. Remember what a JL matrix is? A JL matrix is something that that satisfies uh, the the conditions of the JL theorem. Uh, that satisfies the the sort of statement of the JL theorem, which means that it sort of preserves the distances to of a certain point set to a factor one plus minus epsilon. That's what we call a JL matrix. Okay, and specifically, I can create a JL matrix by by sort of taking a D by K frame and then and then filling it up with with Gaussians n zero one entries or with plus minus ones, uh, sampled according to the uh, to the algorithm Bacheliotis, and then uh, I could normalize it so that the length of each column, uh, so that the expected length of each, the expected squared length of each column is one. Okay, and now we just we obtain B by just multiplying A with R. That's it. That's my B. Okay, so you can imagine that that, that this is is pretty efficient, right? This takes time order n d k. Okay, this multiplication. And also notice that uh, just for sanity check, if I calculate expectation of B B transpose, that is equal to uh, a times. Uh, if I replace B by uh, A times R, then this comes out to be expectation of E R R transpose A transpose. And it's not very hard for you to see that expectation of R R transpose under the condition is, is identity because every entry has uh, uh, unit variance. Every, every R I J has unit variance and because the R I Js are independent of each other. Therefore, the covariance of any two entries is zero. Right? So based on this, you can say that, the, that this expectation comes out to be A transpose. So, uh, so the matrix BP tra transpose certainly has the right expectation. Right? So now, we know that the matrix R, so now, now, now I, want to, I want to make sure that, uh, I want to make sure that uh, the error A transpose minus BB transpose is small. Okay? So in fact, this should be A transpose minus BB transpose. Okay, and this is really again uh, just a simple application of the of the JL property. Okay, what we can show is that uh, so remember what is the two norm of A transpose minus BB transpose? It's really the supremum. So so the two norm of a matrix A is really the supremum of A X over all X that is two norm one, right? So therefore, with uh, only a little bit of algebra. 
the two norm of this of this of this particular matrix a transpose minus bb transpose is given by uh, you have to multiply it by 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 x let's say i mean an equivalent way would be to sort of uh, uh, An equivalent way would be to just take maximum of x transpose a x such that the two norm of uh, such that the two norm of uh, uh, of x is one, right? And once you once you apply this inequality, you see this. Once you apply this equality, you see this that what I need to bound is the supremum of a x of uh, of this quantity under the condition of x a square, the length of x a square minus the length of x a r square. Right, under the condition that x has unit norm. Okay, and uh, so now how do we bound this? Now for a fixed x, right? So, so imagine x times a is y. X times a is y. Right. So then, this is nothing but bounding y, the length of y, minus the projected length of y, minus the length of the projection y r. Right, and by using the Johnson Linden Strauss property, this is exactly what we know to be small. Right, we know that the probability that the that the length y r uh, the, the length of y r lies between uh, I mean crosses one plus epsilon times the length of y is exponentially small. Right, is uh, is is smaller than exp of minus c k epsilon square. So you have not written down exactly this form. Right, but this is what the form that uh, uh, that came out when we were actually doing the proof of Johnson Linden Strauss, and then in this form we plugged in k to be one by epsilon square log one by delta, and then we get this quantity, the right hand side quantity, to, to be less than delta k to be. I mean, there has to be some hidden constants in there. Right. So now, so now we know. So now, using the pro, uh, the random projection, the length preserving property of R, we know that for a specific x, this quantity is small. Right. So now, what do we do for the? I mean, uh, small as in it lies. It's of this order. It's of the order of the length of y. Okay. It's of the order of the squared length, epsilon times the squared length of y. So, but but this is a supremum over an infinite set of vectors. So what do we do? We have uh, we have to take a union bound, but we can't really just take a union bound over an infinite set of vectors. Right. So what a, a standard trick here is to do something like. Something called an epsilon net argument. That is, what we do is to say that okay, it's actually enough to show this, right? For all y, that is unit norm, right? And so, what we want to show is that let us take the unit ball and let us put points on it. And I want to put points on it such that the distance. I want to put enough points on it so that the distance between any two of them is not more than epsilon. Right. So, so, so every point. So, I'm marking these red points, and I want to make sure. I want, I, want, I want to make sure that any point on this ball is has a red point not far off. Um, I mean, a, any point on this ball, right, has a red point to it that is closer than epsilon. Okay. So, just to frame it in a different way, that uh, if I were drawing a epsilon radius ball around every red point. Right, the, these balls will of course overlap, but the union of these balls will be the entire surface of the sphere. Okay, so I'll cover the entire surface of the spheres by drawing balls of radius epsilon around uh, around these red points. Okay, so this is known as the epsilon net. Right, and uh, it is uh, I mean uh, using such an epsilon net argument. Right, so we need to draw an epsilon net in, for a ball. Right, that has a dimension which is more or less the rank of a. We can actually do better later. In in, in later uh, in later class, we'll see a, uh, a better bound on the on the on the target dimension that we need. But for now, it's enough for you to note, right, that that if you take k to be, let's say, rank of a by epsilon square, right, with some log factors, then using this epsilon net argument, we can show that that this quantity. We can show that this quantity a transpose minus bb transpose is less than epsilon times a transpose, right? Using basically the Johnson Linden Strauss uh, theorem and some union bound, some clever union bound uh, arguments. Okay, so so this would then allow us us to use b, 
this particular b in finding out a low rank approximation of a okay and uh, and that's and that's and that's very useful and we'll see repetitions of this of this particular theme so in summary johnson and lindstrom's projections are a very versatile pool uh, there's a uh, there's a tight bound uh, on the number of uh, target dimensions right uh, there are a number of ways to construct these that we need for Johnson and Strauss, uh, um, and, and this bound depends on both the error parameter, right, as well as uh, I mean on the confidence value delta that we want to have, right. In the uh, um, if you want delta to be let's say like one by n, or you want it to hold for n square pairs of points, right, you want to set the um, I mean uh, yeah, you need to make a delta to be to be of the order of one by n, then the then the target dimension needs to depend on log 1 over epsilon square log 1 by delta, which is 1 over epsilon square log n. Okay. Uh, we saw a very specific application of, of this uh, random projection in creating uh, low dimensional sort of factorizations of a matrix. Okay. And we will see a little more of these. So the time taken, so, so then let us look at a little more about uh, how to create more efficient random projections. Okay. The time what is the time taken for, for creating a random projection of a vector of dimension d? Okay. The matrix is of, uh, is of size k by d, the vector has dimension d, and therefore uh, the, the matrix vector multiplication takes time order kd. Because this k, and, but this k is 1 over epsilon square, so this is not a very nice quantity, right? Because uh, if you set epsilon to be, let's say, like 0.01, okay, there are we already have d times 100. d itself was fairly big. So this, so can I sort of make it faster? Can I create a random projection faster? Well, we could have if we, if the target dimension was smaller. But we know that it's not very small. It's, it, it cannot be smaller than this. So can we make it faster while keeping the target dimension to be the same? This is a question that we investigate in this, in the rest of this lecture. Okay. So let's do a thought experiment. And suppose we are not reducing the target dimension, but we are making the matrix very, very sparse, right? In the, in, in the sense that suppose in the extreme case, right, if the matrix has only one non-zero per, per row, then matrix vector multiplication is very easy, right? It would take only time order k, right? Because I need to store, I mean, if I happen to store in a matrix, I need to be a little clever. I cannot store the zeros. I have to store a sparse representation of the matrix, right? And therefore, write up the matrix vector multiplication routine a little more cleverly and I can uh, do the matrix, uh, I mean, uh, exploit the sparsity to reduce this time. So specifically, let us create a matrix like this, right? That suppose I put in a zero with probability one minus p. And with probability p, I sample, I create a sample from this distribution n zero one over square root p, right? And then, and then I put in that value in, in Aij. So why am I normalizing this? It's again to, to make the each entry need variance. That's why you have this 1 over square root p out here. Right? So now most of the, uh, so 1 minus p fraction of the entries are zeros. And the rest have some Gaussian value put in them. Right? So now imagine in the extreme that p is more or less like 1 by d. Right? And what I was saying, that, that is the case that happens before, that most rows have a constant number of entries. So the time taken to do the matrix vector multiplication is now uh, kdq, order kdq, right, which is order k only. But is this really, a, uh, I mean, a jail matrix? Does it, does it satisfy the, the conditions of the johnson linden strauss projection? Well, it might not, right? And this is, and this is, really, the, this is really the problem. The problem is that, that suppose you have uh, a particular, I mean, because, because every row has only constant number of uh, constant number of ones there might be a column that is all zero and imagine that uh, uh, if there's a column in a that is all zero imagine just giving it a ran giving it a vector that has one only for that particular column and zeros everywhere else so then the norm of this vector is one but the norm of x is zero 
right? So therefore, Ax cannot be within a, a one plus minus epsilon approximate. I mean, factor of the of the input vector x, right? So then, this doesn't work as a. I mean, we we cannot hope to prove a Johnson and Nestor's bound for this matrix. However, imagine that if the matrix, if the if the original vector was dense, if instead of this I had a one over square root d for every entry, right? Then such a condition cannot happen, and then and then we would be fine, right? So, can I only work with dense vectors? Well, I have to give the Johnson and Nestor's bound for all vectors. So, what can we do? So, can I pre-process my vector to make it dense, right? But, uh, but I have to make sure that the time taken for pre-processing is not more than the time taken for to do the projection itself, right? And, 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 and this is the algorithm that was proposed by Elion and Chazelle, called the fast Johnson Linden Strauss transformation. The main ingredient here is something called the Hadamard matrix. So, what is a Hadamard matrix? Well, a, a Hadamard matrix is a, uh, of dimension d, right? Is a, is a d by d matrix, right? It's only defined when d is, 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 is 2 to the k. And it's defined in this recursive way. You must have seen this before. That the Hadamard matrix H1 is nothing but the matrix that contains only one. H2 is the matrix 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, right? H, H2 to the k plus 1 is defined recursively that you get four copies of H2, H2 to the k, right? And you, uh, yeah, you place the copies uh, side by side, right? Except that you put in a negative in one of the copies. So basically, H4 would be you put in 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. So I'm just putting copies of h2, 1, minus 1, and then minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. This is h4. And then you keep on going to h8, h16, and so on. Okay. So why is this nice? So first of all, uh, it is defined only when the, uh, the dimension is of the form 2 to the k. So let's assume this. And this is not too, uh, this is not such a bad assumption because uh, I mean, if the dimension is not of size two, uh, is of size not of size two to the k, then by at most doubling it, I can reach it a power of two to the k. Okay. So now it's easy to see that multiplying h d times x h d, I mean h d is is let's say the d by d Hadamard matrix. So I'll refer to both h d and h. Uh, so multiplying h d times x takes only Instead of taking d squared time, it takes only time d log d. And why is that? Because of this, of this recursive way, right? Because in order to multiply, I needed to do h d by 2, h d by 2, h d by 2, minus h d by 2, and then x1 and x2. Where x1 is of, is of dimension d by 2, and x2 is of dimension d by 2. So then I need to multiply h d by 2 with x1, h d by 2 with x2, but again, in order to fill up the next one, I need to multiply h d by 2 again with x1 and minus h d by 2 x2. So I need to do, so I need to do only two multiplications, right? That's of, of a matrix of size d by 2 by d by 2 with a vector of size d by 2, right? And I can fill up the entire, and I can do uh, the multiplication of h d with x using only two, two multiplications of the form h uh, d by 2 with some vector of dimension d by 2. Therefore, if you, if you happen to write down the recursion, it turns out to be like this. The t of d, which is the time taken to do the, uh, the d by d matrix vector multiplication, is here is 2 t d by 2 plus order d, which if you roll out the recursion, turns out to be order d log d. Right? So instead of, instead of d square, for a general d by d matrix, uh, I mean d by d matrix vector multiplication, uh, it's now order d log d. So now the next step what we'll do is a densification using Hadamard. Yeah. So before I explain what it is, uh, I mean uh, why it works, let me just show it, show it to you what it is. That we have a diagonal matrix D such that Dii is uh, is plus one with probability half and minus one with probability half. And then given a uh, given a vector x, I first multiply it with the with the diagonal matrix D, then I multiply it with the Hadamard matrix H, and I get y. So this y we, we'll call it as the densified version of x. So a couple of things to note. First is that this also takes time d log d because multiplying by diagonal is only linear time. Secondly, h times d is an orthonormal vector. 
uh, is an orthonormal matrix because H is orthonormal matrix and this particular D that we have defined is also orthonormal matrix. Okay. So, so the intuition behind this is that H itself is a rotation and by using something known as the uncertainty principle, right, uh, which basically says that H is a kind of Fourier transform. So the uncertainty principle says that a signal cannot be sparse both in the original domain as well as in the Fourier domain, which means that a, if I apply H to a sparse vector, it becomes a dense vector. However, because H is a, is a full rank matrix, it is, and because it is a rotation itself, I mean some dense vector also be the pre-image of some, of some sparse vector. So therefore, if an adversary gives me, uh, find, gives me such a dense vector, my output of the H of X will be a dense vector. So, and I cannot allow that to happen. I always want my output to be dense. I always want my Y to be dense. So therefore, I have to come up with this, with this random diagonal matrix, which sort of says that, that the adversary cannot, without sort of knowing the random bits, the adversary doesn't really know how to come up with a pre-image of a sparse vector. Right? And the way to formally sort of state this is as follows, is that what you can say is that for any X, that is, that is 2 norm 1, if you look at the maximum entry in HDX, right? So, so HDX is also has 2 norm 1. So therefore, the average entry is 1 over square root D. If it was completely dense, all the entries would be 1 over square root D. What it says, what this says is that the, av uh, the maximum entry is not much more than this average entry. So the maximum entry is something like square root of log ND by square root D, the maximum entry, which means that HDX is a pretty dense vector, right? And this, the getting, I mean, uh, getting this bound is not, I mean, conceptually, it's not very hard, just application of chain of set, tail inequality. So now we are almost done, because we, uh, because now that we have, we have a dense vector y, we can apply our previous sparse projection matrix, right, on this dense vector y, and my final matrix is this matrix p times h times d, is my final projected vector, okay? So, and this is my jail matrix. So first I'll apply the diagonal matrix on X, then I'll apply the Hadamard transformation, then I'll apply the sparse projection matrix, right? And this is the, uh, this is the first johnson dennis transformation given by Eileon and Chazelle. It says that if I happen to choose Q, so remember Q was the, Q was the uh, how sparse I made the matrix. Q is that probability, right? Only, uh, I, I, I expect only, uh, I mean, only Q fraction of the entries to be non-zero. So if I choose Q to be of the order of the, of the maximum entry of uh, uh, maximum entry squared of X, which in this case turns out to be log N D by D, then PhD satisfies the JL property, which is the one plus minus epsilon length preservation. And setting this value of Q makes that calculation of the, of the, of the PhD X takes time order D log D plus K log N D. Huh? Remember that the original uh, time was order D times K. And now we have boiled it down to something like D plus K with some log factors thrown in. And potentially, therefore, this is much faster than the, than the Gaussian concentration, okay? So, so we'll talk about the application of this to locality-sensitive hashing later, uh, but just some references. There's a very nice book on the random projection method by Santosh Vempala. You can also find uh, this in chapter two of the Foundations of Data Science, which is a free book by uh, 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 Blum, Hopcroft, and Kanan. There's a survey by, by Long Chen at this link. And the fast Johnson linear trans transformation is obtained from this paper by in the Siam Journal of Computing. In the next lecture, we'll talk about an application uh, on fast locality sensitive hashing. Uh, that's by that's from a paper of ours. And uh, thank you. <laughs>